I mean, I, I must admit this is probably the most distinguished panel I've ever been associated with. Uh, so there are people, uh, obviously, with backgrounds that would give insights that many of us would not have. So, uh, so Mr. Moderator, would you allow us to argue among ourselves? I would encourage <laughs> argument because I think that will make it much more exciting. However, no weapons may be used, <laughs> including lasers. Okay, uh, so scratch your heads and, uh, yes, sir. Uh, uh, so, hi, I'm Upman Yumadov, UCSB and Uber. So, I did not hear anybody mention millimeter wave communication at all. Uh, it sort of sits between light and, and radio as we think about it, and uh, the small wavelengths allow you uh, highly accurate positioning, potentially, and of course there's huge amounts of spectrum there. Um, also, because it dies quickly, it's perfect for the areas where you need more spatial reuse, like urban canyons. So the carriers probably would have no excuse to ask for more spectrum in the lower, uh, lower frequency bands because they can deploy potentially millimeter wave uh, uh, communication in, in the places which need it most. And for example, there's seven gigahertz of unlicensed spectrum at 60 gigahertz alone. So I just wanted your comment, especially Dr. Cooper's on, on that. Well, I, you know, I think I, I uh, mentioned millimeter wave communications only by inference. Uh, when I talked about optimizing uh, wireless communications, every communications ought to use whatever the optimum band is. So uh, it, with our present system... We got a feedback problem. I, did I do that? No, I think it's my mic next to yours. Let me turn it off. Oh, there. Uh, uh, if I wanted to communicate with you on a cell phone, I'd probably be using 70 megahertz or, or 700 megahertz or 2 gigahertz, and we could do very well with uh, 60 gigahertz, right? And, and in an optimum system, that's exactly what we would do. So uh, millimeter waves are going to be very important, but they are just another element uh, in the uh, total picture. Could I just make one observation? Please. One of the issues uh, arising is how many devices are going to be transmitting, and uh, the answer is certainly billions of them. But I would argue that the bulk of them will be transmitting over very short distances, that a lot of the Internet of Things that you hear about will be kind of very much local. And so I think high frequency is our friend in that case. No question. Uh, I would add on, on that also, that is an important topic, and, and there have been a number of experiments recently, particularly New York University, Ted Rappaport, some of their, their efforts that show with a large number of antennas that the lengths that we can reliably transmit in these uh, millimeter wave bandwidths are, are, are far more optimistic than had been believed uh, previously, maybe even avoiding the need for line of sight. So it's certainly an exciting area. It may have been exaggerated to some degree, as many uh, technologies are in the early phases, but I do think there's some, uh, some meat there in the future uh, to actually realize that not only inside, but even outside as some kind of front hall or back hall uh, to, uh, to other cell sites. Well, having said that, there is a, an economic problem because uh, uh, one of the aspects of millimeter waves is, is millimeter apertures, and, and it's very hard to pump energy through a millimeter aperture. So yeah, there's an economic balance. Uh, you need a lot of an, uh, antennas. As, uh, could, could someone uh, shed light on what the status is of hardware that would support such, an app, uh, such a use of mil millimeter waves? Uh, I, I'm just not familiar with it at all. Uh, Erwin? Yeah, there's uh, already going into chip 60 gigahertz type of operation. <clears throat> and the idea there is that you can transmit uh, from your phone, which is going to do everything, to a large screen, even ultra HD TV, and in fact, several channels right now. So you do get the bandwidth, but that it's already moving toward commercial use. Yeah. So commercial parts are available with that caveat that the range is quite restricted, and they're affordable, I presume? The answer is yes. I, I've seen them in operation. I don't know if they're actually being sold, but I think it is in this, this coming generation so, uh, of chips. Ted, Ted Rappaport's group uh, reported the other side of the equation, which is using MIMO. You can get substantial amounts of uh, transmission distance, even at these very high frequencies. So these things are our friends in two, two different 
fashions, I think. Mm -hmm. And for the case of transmitting to a big screen, like people sitting here transmitting stuff through this display, uh, it's a good thing that the propagation distance is limited and the power levels don't need to be very high. And MIMO is available at yeah. multi and yeah. I'm uh, 60 gigahertz is the nearby oxygen absorption band. Do you want to turn on your microphone so other people can hear you? It doesn't seem to want to. Well, the comment that, that Jim made is that it is near the oxygen absorption band, right. which, which is correct, I, um, and, and that may limit by itself. David? Sure. Yeah, I, I, um, I'm fascinated by this kind of question because I made the comment that you've got uh, two ships passing in the night with their lights off, um, being optical on the one side and uh, you know, the wireless on the other, and is there a reason for that? And the answer is, I think there's a, what I sometimes call uh, your darkest Africa in the middle. Um, because uh, we don't have the technology and we don't necessarily have um, a, a good transmission window. And I think 60 gigahertz, as I understand it, and you're the expert, uh, is, uh, is okay for short distance. But when we go to terahertz, uh, for example, we really begin to run into two problems. One is, it's very hard to generate. And because you, you can't make oscillators anymore uh, beyond uh, something like a, a terahertz. And so you have to go to quantum devices like lasers and so on. And uh, you know, the physics has been amazingly helpful to us. And it's given this extraordinary window where optics works and an extraordinary window where wireless works, but not so friendly in the middle. So let me just add something to that. One of the issues that, I mean, we're going to small cells, both for local operation and for lots of frequency reuse. Uh, the problem is then how do you uh, connect that back to the, the network? And I think we're going to see a backhaul being largely accomplished in the future by uh, optical links. Oh, that's interesting. So, I mean, not, but not necessarily just fiber, though. You're thinking free space no, optics? No, free space free as space well. Depending on the di various distances. Interesting. Various Clark, you had a question. Uh, I'm just pushing back on the the commercial readiness of fiber, because uh, it does seem like just from what you read in the paper that the financial community is still investing in satellites. Uh, so I'm just wondering if uh, just how ready your solution really is. Oh, I have a part of a response to that, you know, Google has this Google Fiber project, and one of the things we learned is digging up streets is expensive, and so finding another way of transmitting data uh, by RF or even optical free space lasers is very attractive because the cost is so much less. So there is uh, certainly commercial interest, at least in that. Well, product. yeah, but you were talking about latency type sensitive, latency sensitive applications. Yeah, uh, um, free space has been around, of course, since time immemorial. Um, shortly after the, uh, the invention of the laser, the first experiments were done. Um, problem is, of course, if you happen to live in the UK, like I do, um, then uh, it rains a lot, it gets foggy, uh, and, and you know, the, out the, the uptime can be quite limited. So you have to overcome that, and there have been various solutions, one of which is a hybrid system, uh, which uses um, a microwave antenna with optics in the middle. Um, but it's, it's a problem, and that's why Charles Cowell invented the fiber to overcome that problem, right? Um, so you have a nice uh, environment in, in the core of the fiber, um, which is not too friendly outside. Then you've got to worry about atmospheric turbulence as well. There's a famous experiment done in the early days where a free space link was uh, set up to, uh, in London and uh, if you Google it and look for horizon, you'll see that it, it wobbles. That's the trouble with atmospheric turbulence. Mm. And, uh, and this gives you a lot of outage. So I have a question for you. Uh, I've heard reports that either femtosecond or attosecond pulse lasers actually do better in foggy environments than a continuous beam. Is that something you would know about? Uh, yes, but uh, only if they're high enough power to fry the uh, <laughs> water. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> and we'll deliver you a hot dead bird along with everything. Else. <laughs> Got it. Just to, to stir up some trouble, Irwin, uh, if, if I'm right about there's an infinite amount of spectrum, why would you bother with uh, optical fibers if you could 
uh, do backhaul wirelessly. Uh, yeah, actually, I think there's going to be a mixture of, of the two. Yeah, but I, I've not heard your infinite claim before, mm -hmm. or, or, but uh, one of the fo focuses that Qualcomm has been on a thousand times increase in capacity. You bet. And a lot of that is, part of that is achieved through small cells, just lots of frequency reuse, which does get you to the backhaul uh, issue. Um, LTE broadcast came up, and uh, mm. that can be dynamically used. And in fact, there are a few companies who are already moving ahead with that. Uh, so that's where you can handle a number of users. If they're sharing the same content, you judge that dynamically, switch it to broadcast mode. Mm -hmm. Broadcast mode works also very well if you don't have a receive and transmit frequency, dual frequency mm -hmm. assignment, just um, <coughs> a single frequency. And so that raises the interesting issue of getting rid of all the over-the-air uh, television, right. switching it to LTEB, and uh, making that available in a much more flexible fashion. Um, the technology is basically available, the devices are all available, and so that gives you a lot of possibilities. And one last thing, the small cells on the broadcast, people are using that now in stadiums. Mm -hmm. So they have small cells, and most people are watching the same content or just a few different channels, and so the broadcast works exceedingly well there. Huh. Well, question over here, please. Hi, I'm Akansha. I'm a young scholar from 2012. My question is that uh, with multiple signals in the air, like broadcast and everything else, what's the challenge in commercializing, say, combining GPS signals with RF signals to localize objects or synchronize uh, where a particular device is when it's moving? Uh, because I imagine smartphones uh, are trying to do this already today, but I, I, but they are not doing a great job at it if I'm in the downtown of a major city. Repeat the question. Yeah, I can repeat the question. Yeah, try the question one more time. We're trying to get our mind. How do you fuse uh, multiple signals, say RF, like LTE signals and GPS signals to get very accurate localization of devices, both outdoors and indoors, the one meter accuracy claim that Brad wanted for our devices in the next generation? Is that commercially possible today? And I, Not only is it possible, I think it's done. Uh, or one, but one, right, there's still, there are a lot of sensors and a lot of radiating uh, devices around, Wi-Fi, et cetera, as well as cellular, and um, uh, actually beacons as well these days. And so putting all that together in a reasonable <coughs> fashion without using too much computing power, or in particular being able to do it without using too much ongoing energy is important, but that's happening. We'll, we'll do it better and better, and um, that's where, uh, uh, actually having uh, artificial intelligence type capabilities in the chip as well, which is available now. And they learn a bit as they're going along. And so we'll see how that all works through, but that's the intent. We had one question here and then one back there and then I'll take that one. Let's hope, please. Hi, uh, Logan Scott. My question is this, uh, basically we're getting very good at, at figuring out where we are in terms of position and I'm wondering how that's going to play into spectrum management. Specifically I'm thinking things like cognitive radio and there's going to be a sea change as we move from knowing where we are to accuracies of 10 meters down to say the sub-meter level in knowing what the propagation environment is going on. How can we take advantage of that? Oh well, yeah, I'd like to to speak on that one, my, my, my company's been involved in, in the management of spectrum. And what do you find today? In fact, there was a question earlier on fiber. We kind of, uh, you know, even if you get fiber to everyone's home, which is too expensive, uh, throw in the copper commercial, there's 500 million DSLs running at speeds the gigabit per second now also. But once you get into the home, every, all, all the 80% all the of the mobile data is actually going over to devices like tablets and, and, and <coughs> smartphones and other devices inside the home. And you will find that, that over 50% of that is corrupted bad enough that it's disturbing uh, the customers. We probably all have had the experience where the video stops and starts. So management is extremely important, especially in the unlicensed bands, and they are the most heavily used. Uh, right now with Wi-Fi, typical <coughs> urban environment in the United States, you see at least 24 SSIDs, okay, in, inside a, an MDU building for sure, you're doing that. So 
um, that is going to be very crucial uh, and, and done in a statistical way in the cloud to try to resolve some of the issues. And the position of the device within the home, even it, you see things like MIMO and relays actually make it worse uh, rather than better uh, in terms of things interfering with one another. So uh, yeah, there's going to be some very smart systems that are needed to actually balance this, uh, particularly inside the home. Uh, Erwin had yeah, something. And, and again, there's a, a lot of investigation going on right now with LTE in the unlicensed bands and working very well as far as getting additional capacity beyond just 802.11 type technology. And so I think that is possible. And then a lot of these uh, capabilities uh, are being already examined for LTE. Mm -hmm. So it could very well quickly move <coughs> over to the license band and then within homes. So Brad, question. Isn't there something like optical Wi-Fi now <coughs> where people are putting things in the light bulbs and using them to broadcast? And it's use? called Li-Fi. Li-Fi. Li 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 yeah. Li yeah. So what's, what's with that? I am not the expert on that. Uh, no, but I know. There, <laughs> there, are, there are standards that are emerging that, that use those uh, and they modulate the, the light. And so that, that can doesn't be interfere kind of with everybody else no, because no, it no. kind of stays in the room. It's totally right. orthogonal yeah. and very limited. So I think we used to call this IRDA, remember? Yeah. <laughs> which was in every, it was, was in every smartphone, but yes. maybe it was before its time. Um, exactly why you would put it in the light uh, is less than clear to me as an optics guy. Well, the, uh, there's also a tremendous amount of effort worldwide now looking at the, the actual street lights and putting these communication systems into the, light, the lighting band that you're talking about and communicating nearby the street lights as well to you know, illuminate. Uh, Talk well, about shedding light. I mean, yeah, right, yes. Uh -huh. exactly. Well, but, uh, but the event, you don't have to go up to light. You, even at 60 or 100 gigahertz, <laughs> would be you fine. put energy out in a room and it doesn't get yep. to the next yep. room. Yeah. yeah, I think my, my point was that uh, from an optics perspective, you do better off if you were just to put a tiny LED in there and because mm -hmm. it's very narrow band, you can filter it out um, and it, it, the extra cost is, is almost nothing. Day minimums. Yeah. It, anything else to add? Uh, way in the back, I think, was next. Uh, gentleman in the black shirt. Yes, the hand. question is about the, has the internet protocol been fully um, transferred to the space layer for satellite communications uh, instead of being a simple pass through that the satellite layer is actually now an internet node? Are the, do the protocols and the whole communication structure allow for that nowadays? I know 10 years ago, Cisco was working on that fairly hard. I, 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 I'm dangerous. I almost understand the question um, in terms of layers. And the question, as I understand it, is whether this is, is being done in such a way the satellite can just act like another portion of an internet. Is that what your question is? Yes, an internet okay. node instead of a, a pass-through uh, transponder. Well. There, there have been a number of attempts at putting intelligence in the satellites themselves and, let, and to let them do the switching. Okay. And I don't think <clears throat> we're flying. Cisco flew a satellite with a router in it at one point, but that's the only one that I know about, unless there's stuff going on in the military that isn't. You know, but the implication of that is the answer to your question is yes, because evidently they did understand that. Yeah. You, you, I thought your question was whether the protocol was clear, and it sounds like it is, at least in one case. But it may be the case you already knew about. All right. Yes, sir. So it seems to me there are two separate topics that are being discussed here overlapping. Uh, and I'm not talking about GPS versus communications, but rather sort of the point-to-point -point communication capabilities that we get with broadcast needs. And so the question I'd like to ask is about the broadcast side of things. A number of years ago, one of our colleagues proposed that the way you should handle information access in a building is just have a fiber loop and just take all the information, it's high enough bandwidth, take all the information that you'd ever want, like a Library of Congress's work, and just keep it circulating so you just plug into the wall and pull off what you want when it comes around. So the question is, if you try to apply that idea in any larger sense, even if you had enough bandwidth to do that, in your view, is this a good idea, and or is this a bad idea, and we should just drop it completely? Or if it's not a bad idea, is there any way you can see to make this possible in the combined world of uh, fiber and wireless? So that's a carousel notion, 
and, and the problem with carousels is that it takes a while for stuff to come back around if you missed any of it. And there's a finite amount of it that you can transmit in any particular cycle. So my uh, recollection of examining this uh, is that it didn't it didn't serve a large enough community unless the, the case was that everybody wanted to see almost the same kind of information. Either that or it takes too long for the all the, I mean, consider all the information that's currently on the World Wide Web today. Next. You would never be able to pump all that stuff <coughs> in a carousel until the end of time. So my guess is that that only works for certain applications where there's a finite amount of information that everybody wants. And of course, there's a certain cost in having to install it in existing buildings, which probably rules things out pretty much. The, that's why wireless has such great advantages. Yes, David. Um, great question, Bob. Um, but I think that there's another problem, which is that, um, as I recall, the longest recirculating time ever done uh, in, a, in a fiber was of the order of one hour. And after that, the infections just build up, and even though you put regenerators and amplifiers and so on and so on, it eventually runs away from you. So that's a problem. The gentleman in the red shirt. This is in reference to the um, question of the use of uh, millimeter waves. Um, last year, there was a development <coughs> in um, maser technology materials uh, advancement uh, that uh, enabled the, the use of uh, synthetic diamonds uh, to produce um, high energy continuous wave maser transmissions. And my question is, would uh, that development uh, uh, enhance the ability to uh, transmit uh, your, qu your, uh, your, your point of the difficulty in transmitting millimeter waveforms, especially with the uh, use of an optical fiber? An optical waveguide, I'm sorry. So the question was whether the development in diamond-based masers somehow spans the gap that you were uh, alluding to, and does anyone have an opinion well, about I have that? A clue. Well, I think it, it helps us because uh, any new form of uh, light source, um, which is what's being referred <coughs> to here, is, is helps to fill in my great big dark hole. But it, you still need a communication medium. Um, that will transmit that stuff, and that's often very hard. So, you know, by example, if um, we've got some pretty good UV um, light sources these days, but we sure as hell don't have any any decent waveguides that will work in in, in the ultraviolet. Um, and so, my earlier point was there's a nice little window that physics has been kind to provide us with. Um, it doesn't exist outside of that. So. You know, we kind of got to live with what physics has provided. So there's a, a lower end of the frequency range of, of, uh, that could be used in, a, in an optical waveguide. Is, is that what I'm, I'm understanding from what you're saying? That is our current understanding. It's always dangerous to say that it can't be done at some time in the future, right? But the, the indications um, are not good uh, just because of materials that we have available to us today. Any other answers? Christoph. Christoph Günther from German Aerospace Center. I don't think your mic is on. Christoph Günther from German Aerospace Center. Um, my, uh, my remark is more a, a comment rather than a question. Um, and it um, uh, concerns optical communication and actually also the, uh, how optical communication and microwave or, or RF communication can complement each other. And um, we're working on satellite communication and um, we are uh, there is this general problem of uh, serving all the areas that are um, outside the, the, the big centers and uh, one way of doing that is by satellites but we have to do it efficiently and um, this is the reason why we look at using uh, RF or microwave communications for communicating with the user because uh, the user might be under clouds and uh, we can do a lot of very small um, beams uh, uh, down to, to the earth from a satellite. But the problem that uh, arises is how do we connect a satellite to the internet? And that's where we want to use optical technology. So optical is for transport. 
And we've developed two things so far. I mean, um, one technology is basically uh, we developed it for uh, downloading uh, data from um, Earth observing satellites. And uh, there we have the same problem. But, um, the sensors are getting higher and higher resolution with big amount of data we want to download. And we developed a um, very concise terminal, can download one gigabit. Now, this is not so impressive when we want to do uh, uh, internet, but I mean, this technology can be further developed to uh, 10 or 40 uh, gigabits. And this is a very good um, approach for um, serving the type of um, systems <coughs> that are considered by um, OneWeb or others, uh, sa satellite constellation with many satellites. A more interesting, uh, or maybe a <laughs> another a very interesting approach is to use geostationary satellite. And there the question is really, how do we connect uh, geostationary satellites with a terabit to, to, to the internet? And the difficult part is actually the uplink there. And uh, because we first go through the atmosphere, and the atmosphere um, uh, causes small uh, disturbance in the angle, and we don't hit the satellite anymore. And um, so the first thing that we were asking, does it work at all? And uh, um, the interesting thing is that uh, just last week, uh, we did a, a, a test, on a, not on a satellite, but on a, a an equivalent terrestrial um, distance, which is a little more than 10 kilometers. And uh, we were able to transmit 1.7 terabit per second. And that's roughly, that's getting interesting. And um, uh, now clearly the, our next task is now, this was not very stable, that's clear. We didn't expect that because the atmosphere is, uh, we have um, turbulence of the um, index of refraction and we have to deal with that. And we have a number of techniques that we think we can deal with that and that's what we're going to develop next. So I think um, there it's, a, it's an area where actually uh, optical has a big, play, a big role to play. But we can't dispense of RF because we won't be able to serve the users otherwise because we never know where the user is under a cloud. Yeah? And uh, actually, multi-user <coughs> optical is not something we have today. Today, um, uh, RF is very good for multi-user. Optical is extremely good at point-to-point. Uh, at, at point -point, yeah? And uh, so that's the way we, saw, we see things. And there's a, 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 an additional thing that is uh, extremely interesting is uh, we can also use such links uh, in space between satellites. And we are actually uh, looking at um, synchronizing uh, GNSS satellites uh, using optical links, using optical clocks on the satellite, and um, doing time transfer. The actual limitation is not in the, um, in the measurement using those signals, but the actual limitation is to to get good models for the vibrations of a satellite. Yeah? Yeah. We can, we can uh, the, the measurement accuracy is so big, I mean, we, we are at micrometer level for, for, for um, distances and, uh, uh, or uh, uh, fractions of femtoseconds for, for time. So it's so, so extremely accurate because we have this very high focusing of the, of the, of the um, uh, laser beam. And um, uh, that we really have to have good models and to see whether we can sample the vibrations of a satellite and things like that. Interesting. That's the interesting questions. Uh, any comments on the comment? No. Well, I, that was a comment. I didn't, uh, I didn't hear the question. Didn't hear a question. <laughs> <laughs> but, but uh, I mean... <laughs> I would have a question, the, but it's the, in the, on the another topic. The work that's going on in, in um, yeah, astronomy sorry. is really you know, amazing stuff. Yes, they spend billions on, a, on an astronomical uh, telescope. I'm well aware of that. But you know, that kind of technology, adaptive optics, where you have deformable mirrors or even more clever optical versions, can resolve a lot of the issues that you have, um, can deliver the beam, uh, diffraction limited uh, almost, uh, onto the target. And I think that technology will be with us if it's not already here, but within a few years. And I think that'll simplify. Um, your problem. The other great thing about it is, of course, if you're doing satellite to satellite, um, then you're out, you're out of the atmosphere and so you don't care what wavelength you use, um, and the, s the shorter the better so that the optics can get smaller, which is you know, another great advantage. But I kind of wondered, and I wonder if this is a question for Vint, um, you made the comment that uh, you you worry about uh, the downlink um, or indeed the uplink when there's clouds around. Um, if you were to scoot it to another satellite where there wasn't any clouds and download <laughs> there and then you have to join the, inter the internet 
and get it to, to the customer that way. I don't know if anybody's looked at yes. the protocols. Yeah. Yes, they have. In fact, Google has a project called Loon because it's kind of loony. Uh, they're putting, yeah, <laughs> minus two. They are balloons that are up around 60,000 feet, and they are intended to go around the Earth at, at roughly speaking the same latitude. They do inter-balloon transfers, and the whole idea is to see if we can't do that optically in order to increase capacity. And if, do I remember correctly that Iridium did a satellite-to-satellite -satellite yes. transfer as well? Mm -hmm. yes. So there's experience uh, with the protocols that are required to do that. Pointing accuracy is going to be uh, a significant contribution to success if it's a laser-based system. So uh, the answer is that's a very fruitful place to look. I think yeah, we have time maybe. for one more question. Oh, Yeah, this is Paul Raj uh, from Stanford. You know, for those of us who are not very familiar with, with the wireless propagation, I, just, I thought I'll mention a fun fact. Uh, it's typical, you know, uh, it's typical uh, wisdom is that at high frequency, like millimetric band, you have a lot of loss. Uh, in fact, between one gigahertz to two gigahertz in the cellular band, you have more loss at two gigahertz. So where does the loss really come from? It turns out photons fly exactly without, uh, with the same way, whether it's one, two, or 40 gigahertz. So the loss really comes from the fact that uh, we have a radio link, for example, in this room. Uh, the, the, the link budget or path loss is higher at higher frequencies than at lower frequencies. And the reason not because photons don't fly well, but uh, typically a receive antennas have to have a certain beam width. So for example, a base station antenna is seven degrees by 90 degrees wide. Now, so at low frequencies, the antennas are large, so they catch more photons. At higher frequencies, they're much smaller, they catch less photons. So really, there is uh, yes, millimetric band do get absorbed by foliage and by rain, but in a dry atmosphere, they fly equally well with as lower frequencies. Mm. It's the antennas that get smaller. <clears throat> Interesting observation. And of course, that was one of the considerations in GPS, why we picked what we did. If we'd gone up in frequency, less ionospheric delay, more accuracy, unfortunately, a 2 pi steradian antenna wouldn't work very well. So. Uh, we ended up where we are, and unfortunately now we're in a conflict on the non-scarce uh, frequencies with uh, someone who wants to make a lot of money. Uh, all, <laughs> all due respects to Rich Lee here. Uh, it, did we complete it? Uh, let's give a hand for the panelists. Ah, I agree.